the Bazile Influences and Impact section of our conference. We're starting with Nemanja Rudalo oh, Radulovic, I'm sorry, Nemanja, uh, who studied Serbian and comparative literature at Belgrade University. He is full professor of folk literature at the Department of Serbian Literature and South Slavic Literatures in Belgrade. His thesis was on narratives about fate in South Slavic area. Um, please present your piece on A Tale from Pentamorone and its Serbian variant. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, once again, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, this event on the very important and very interesting topic. Um, and of course, thank you for having me uh, here. It is really an honor. I also use the opportunity to apologize to participants from the afternoon session. I have flight in a couple of hours, so I won't be able to listen to you. Uh, so uh, let me start. Uh, I have a presentation, so just a second. Okay, I hope you, you can see it. Um, can you see the, the presentation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, I will be speaking from the folkloric point of view. Um, Vuk Stefanovic Karadžić is the founding father of Serbian folklore studies. In 1921 and um, uh, in uh, 1821 and 1853, he published the collections of folk tales which nowadays have a canonical status comparable to that of Grimm's collection in Germany. However, Karadžić left a lot of unpublished material. It is kept in the archive of the Serbian Academy of, of Sciences and Arts, and it includes many unpublished tales. Among them is uh, one text relevant for our topic. Its plot goes like this. A uh, king has a daughter, three prophets, one after another, foretell that she will be flogged in the square. The king is saddened because of this, understandably, and the daughter asks him why he is sad. He tells her about the prophet. I, the strength of launches the kingdom to the married and the new servant girl participates in the preparations for the activities. Once, while she is working with the diamond, a bird comes through the window, takes the diamond and flies away. The king does not believe her story and orders public, public flogging for her in the square three times. The prophecy is fulfilled. Uh, the text was sent to Karadžić by his collaborator, Vuk Vrčević. Vrčević lived on the Montenegrin coast. He collected a lot of songs, tales and riddles, descriptions of all customs and rituals, and sent them to Karadžić, but he also published some material himself too. Uh, his contribution to Karadžić's collection is very important. He was one of the principal field workers of Karadžić huge network. It consists of, of a lot of favorite tales and religious tales, all from the same region of the coast of Montenegro, collected among uh, the Serbs living there. And his brother-in-law, who was Orthodox priest, was also important part of that field-working network. Uh, the tale stands lonely among the South Slavic material. We don't have any other variant. Um, but it is about fate. Its structure corresponds to the tales and legends about fate in the Balkan and Slavic area. The usual structure, both in tales and legends, is as follows. Foretelling the fate, an attempt at diverting the fate, the fulfillment. The same is, of course, in legends of fate in other European folk traditions, as shown a long time ago by Rolf Wilhelm Bredig. Here we have the structure. The final formula is typical. What was told to her father came in. But the thematic levels are not to be found out. Usually three fates come to foretell the fate to a newborn. Sometimes there are male dispensers of destiny, but, but again, they're supernatural beings. Prophets do not appear. 
the fate is usually death at an early age. In this aspect, this variant is somewhat different. Uh, most of the material about fate in the South Slavic area is, uh, according to Anna Thompson, 930, Richman and his son in law, uh, 938, predestined bride, and 931, Oedipus, and 34, death. If we try to classify this text after Arne Thompson, I, I refer to 61 edition, it would correspond to 934E, false prophecy that princess at six Uterized edition subsumes this sub under under three As for the Italian, it comes from the catalog of Italian tales by <coughs> Ceres and Serafini. <coughs> Sorry. It gives one contemporary variant from Lazio recorded in 1969, fragmentary as it is stated. The Bulgarian variant is given according to the index of Bulgarian tales by Daskalo and Perkovska. But if you take a look into the Bulgarian variant, we can see that it is very different from the Serbian, although classified under 934E according to the Bulgarian index. This variant has nothing to do with what Arne and Thompson describe under this number. Uh, Virchovich's variant is therefore interesting in a wider European context as an example of a rare type. However, there is another parallel, one you have of course already recognized, and that is why this paper is presented on this occasion. This is tale from Pentamerone, the sixth tale of the fourth day, Le Tre Corone. Allow me to summarize it. An unknown voice offers a choice to a king who cannot have children, whether he wants a daughter who will disappear or a son who will destroy him. Uh, since this is a choice between honor and death, the council and the king ponder about that and finally opt for the daughter who will dishonor the king's home by her disappearance. After she is born, they put her in a tower surrounded by guards. But the very first time she goes out tower to meet her future husband, <clears throat> a strong wind takes her away to the home of Orca. I have decided not to translate this since I believe that all of us are familiar with the term. <clears throat> After some period of serving, Princess Marquetta is given a gift, a ring, and later in the woods she meets King. To make to the but the nine hundred. And there are motives typical of fairy tales, childlessness, helping an old woman, a magical gift, a happy end. Common motives to the both are foretelling the shame, fantastic transportation, false accusation, public punishment. Needless to say, there is a remarkable gap between Basile's rich textual language, his baroque style, and the straightforward, simple, paratactic language of a virtuous variant. Still, there are a lot of similarities that justify classifying them under the same tale type. The similarity deserves to be closely re researched, especially since the number of variants is, as we have seen, small. Basile's variant is a, a complete fairy tale. The Serbian variant corresponds to typical Balkan, South Slavic, and European tales about fate. But it uses some fairy tale motives. A prince fighting a girl in the woods, false accusation. All these motives are typical of the persecuted girl tale. Flogging is foretold three times, so there is also number three. The fact of this type, it stays invisible in the background, resembling a little bit to the voice in Basile's variant. Um, Virchovich's text looks like a fairy tale transformed into another tale of fate, or perhaps a tale of fate lavishly adorned fairy tale motives.
dance virtually this poetry, something very common in the 19th century folkloric work. He was a man of literary ambitions. He had an excellent command of Italian from his childhood, as many educated people from that region. He was a teacher of Italian to Montenegrin prince. For him, even Neapolitan dialect would not have been a problem. And after all, as we know, there have been the renderings of Pentameron in Tuscan. Early Serbian politics was rather strict, but were preaching, accusing him of changing the published texts of the lack of authenticity. It was only ambition. And modern perspective, it seems that folklorists from the previous period were too strict. The material and to see this process as a corruption of pure oral tradition, which is, of course, an attitude very typical of the previous period. Of, but they tended to put the blame on virtue, which instead of seeing that as a symbol, more folkloric things are more lenient. Just of Italian to retain the view that virtue is that what he published was seen as a kind of authorial Serbian dictionary. Modern German um, Nemanja, sorry, I think. Let's sorry, hi. Is it mm -hmm. Nemanja? Sorry, there's um there's some sound problems. Um, I think I'm not mm -hmm. sure there's anything we can do about it. But just to warn you that um it is hard just because you're cutting out, and I I don't know if we can. Does anyone have any suggestions? I don't actually think. Is your is your mic working properly? Like, is it plugged in, or is it a part of your laptop, or mm. is it? Uh, yeah, the, the 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 mic is part of the laptop. Okay, so we can't really. It's. I think it's an internet cutting out, maybe. So it's internet. Yes, it's. Yes, the internet is obviously slow, and I have also problem in uh, uh, listening to you. So in case uh, you cannot uh, hear me. Just yeah um so uh, I, sometimes, suppose, I suppose sometimes it's help i suppose if the, I, I suppose if you focus on audio rather than also also video it will help better because the if the internet is a slow it's better to focus on the audio so if you turn can then you turn can your follow. camera off nemanja and we could all turn our cameras off to help maybe <laughs> Um, okay, Nemanja, let's try that. Sorry about, sorry to interrupt. Please carry on. No, no, thank you. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, was included into a Vokarajic dictionary without any explanation, but the name appeared in charms. Some unspecific location signifying the otherworldly and magical place where illness is banished. Um, it is not clear why Virchovich did not develop a full fairy tale, but decided to make a cross between others. The needs of Pentameron and oral storytelling was still under research. Um, at this point, it is necessary to provide some historical and cultural context. So that is my next slide. Mm. The coast on the coast of Dalmatia were heavily influenced by the um, territories. Uh, large part of the Congress of Vienna in 1815 followed when Austria took over Venetian lands. Well, 
the Ottoman Empire by the Serbs and Croats who lived in the territory. A uh, very interesting is example one song from a coastal town of Montenegro sings about the battle with the Spaniards. It is obviously the period when the Spanish ruled Naples. Speaking of folklore, some Italian folk beliefs enter the folklore of the Dalmatian Slavs, like Orko. Educated people read Italian, but even the language of the common Slavic people was influenced by Italian dialects, especially when it comes to material culture. This very text, Virchovich's variant, is full of Italian words. Camera for the room, camera, right? Yair for the air. Both differ from the standard Serbian language and we are not, and are not used, I would say this. And then we have the Italian causative use of fare. Uh, it also influenced the syntax, which is again unusual compared with standard Serbian syntax where, where there is no such causative. Literature in the area was our will from the coastal area. And she gives some examples. She believes them from Brazil, like Sapia Licarda, like Il Catenaccio. And uh, uh, one example is also Basile's La Motella. The girl lives hidden in flower, falls in love with the prince. In video, swimming trick her out of a flower by the sign of a bell. Uh, there is one variant from uh, Dubrovnik, but there is also, and that is important, variant recorded by Vercevic and published in Karadžić's collection of Serbian folk tales. This means that there are at least two examples in Vercevic materials showing some affiliation with Basile. So this unpublished variant should be joined to this group of the Eastern Adriatic mat material Boschkovic Stuli compared to Basile. The question is, as we can see, where is the link between Pentamerone and the recorded oral variant? Perhaps there was a popular Italian reworking that was read among the Slavic population. Another option is that some popular reworking had already entered oral storytelling transmission in Italy, and then it was transported to Montenegro via some of the many possible routes that existed between the both sides of the Adriatic, like merchant or naval contacts. Uh, this brings us to the third possibility, it being that both Vercevic and Brazil's variants stem from a common tradition. That is, of course, what Rudolf Schande refers to as common Mediterranean narrating tradition. And such a tradition exists on other levels. Uh, for example, there are some same types of folk dances in Dalmatia, southern Italy and Spain. There are similarities in beliefs about witches, both in Italy and in Dalmatia. Um, the aforementioned Boschkovic Stuli relies on Shenda, uh, noticing that the same tales are to be found not only in Basile and Montenegro and Dalmatia, but all, also in Pitres' collection of Sicilian tales. So we have three points in the area Basile's Naples, Pitres' Sicily, and 19th and 12th century uh, Dalmatia and Montenegro. And uh, it is not only about Basile, there are other shared sources. For example, in all three corpuses, there are tales obviously coming from Thousand Nights and the Night or from Tutiname. Uh, I'd like to elaborate on this. That means, uh, if I may digress a bit, that the Mediterranean tradition includes an important Oriental aspect, it includes a strong current of storytelling coming from the Near and Middle Orient. We know, of course, that there is strong Arabic influence in Southern Italy. Uh, Similarity between tales, Sicilian tales about Jufa and uh, Arabic Jufa. Uh, and Turkey was another Mediterranean power beside Venice. The Ottoman Empire was bordering with the coast of Montenegro and Dalmatia. Moreover, since Tutiname is a reworking of Indian Shuka Saptati, a much deeper Oriental background should be continually kept in mind, too. Uh, back to Basile. Um, this concept of a common tradition means 
that it is possible that both Basile and Serbian tellers drew from the same oral tradition present in the Adriatic and Mediterranean in story telling. The Greek variant of this story seems to confirm this. Uh, this brings us to the question of Basile's relation to oral tradition. Uh, Professor uh, Gianfrancesco had just said something about that. Mm, it has been described in different ways, as bricolage, as Nicole Belmont describes it, or as using, um, using the fossil for his own creations in a picturesque expression, Michele Rack, or uh, Franco Mugnaini opines that Basile should be should be regarded not as an author, but as a performer, a storyteller himself. So all these subtle and thought-provoking analyses are beyond the scope of this paper. Uh, I focus here on motive and thematic correspondences between the two tales within the common geographical framework. So uh, in this view, we would have an oral tradition emanating in two different places and periods, but places belonging to the same cultural area. Still, the idea of a common Mediterranean tradition and the idea of Basile's influence on oral tradition through a published version do not exclude each other. On the contrary, they're complementary. Oral and written transmissions are intertwined here. And the same goes for other examples. The aforementioned Tutinam and Sinbad's tales existed as Czech books in European languages and in Turkish language too. The same process happened with Pentamerone. Uh, Pentamerone. Oral tale could have entered Pentamerone and then from Pentamerone re-entered oral storytelling. Therefore, it is possible that there was a continual exchange between the two traditions or written in the framework of the Adriatic, which was part of a big common Mediterranean space. Uh, I started with one tale, an unpublished variant from the archives, and I hope that even this small case study can show like a microscope is some deeper processes about the relations between different cultures and between oral and written literatures. Thank you. Thanks, Nemanja. That was that was much clearer <laughs> after we started that out. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nemanja. Um, right, so we'll move on to the next speaker. In Oh, sorry. Next speaker in our panel is David, who's doing women's resistance and rebellion in Giambattista Basile's fairy tales. Um, David Kazi was um, born in Iran in 1973. He was a lecturer of English literature at Persian Gulf University um, for a decade. He gained his doctorate at Osnabrück University in Germany on the comparative study of English, Persian and German folk tales. Um, so, David, where has he gone? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> oh, hi, sorry. You know, <laughs> thank you so much, David. Um, so, I'll spotlight you and, yeah, please start your presentation. Thank you. So, I start. So, just let me know if you hear me properly. Yes, this is okay. Thank you. Okay, very nice. So, Second. Okay. Um, Giambattista Basile's fairy tales have been lauded for their depth, creativity, and regional flair. The tales often espouse and subvert prevailing social norms, offering unique insights into the societal dynamics of the time. In this lecture, I will examine Basile's fairy tales, especially the she bear and the three citrons, from feminist and post colonial perspectives, with some uh, minor references to the enchanted doe. The she bear navigates uh, through the intricate maze of societal norms, patriarchal structures, and preconceived notions about femininity and beauty. It is a compelling a uh, tale that embraces the theory of intersectionality, a term coined by Crenshaw and the feminist critic of patriarchal norms, inviting readers to question traditional perspectives on gender, beauty, and identity. The tale commences with a distressed king fervently seeking a wife as beautiful as his deceased queen. Here, the king's obsessive quest is an exploration of uh, Laura Mulvey's male gaze theory, where women 
are often subjected to objectifying gaze of men, reducing them to passive objects of male desire. His propositions to his daughter, Preciosa, uh, Lorenzo, I hope I don't make a mistake with pronunciation of the names, <laughs> uh, is an extreme uh, manifestation of the patriarchal authority that views women as a means to fulfill male desires. Preciosa's transformation into a she-bear is a potent metaphor for her escape from patriarchal norms and a critic of the societal expectation placed on women. It embodies Judith, uh, Judith Butler's concept of performativity as she assumes an entirely different identity to navigate her life and claim her autonomy. The transformation challenges the rigid confines of femininity prescribed by her society and underscores the constructed nature of gender, implying that gender norms can be negotiated, contested, and redefined. This transformation further resonates with Crenshaw's intersectionality theory. Preziosa's uh, experiences are influenced not by just her gender, but also by her multiple intersecting identities, a woman, a princess, a she-bear, each identity presents unique challenges and shapes her experiences differently. This highlights the importance of considering multiple intersecting layers of identity when examining experience of oppression or privilege. Moreover, her life in the forest and later in the royal king, royal court of the king of Aquacorento, uh, running water, adds an additional dimension to her intersectional identity, the class perspective. As a she-bear, she experiences a life devoid of the luxurious comforts of her royal past, only to be reintroduced to it when the prince takes her in. Her transition across cross uh, class boundaries emphasizes the significance of intersectionality, suggesting that our identities and experiences are not just shaped by gender, but also by other societal categ social categories, such as class and species. Furthermore, her ac acceptance and subsequent affectionate treatment by the prince who is unaware of her true identity disrupts traditional norms of beauty and attraction. His non-traditional attraction towards Preziusta as a she-bear defies the conventional standards of beauty, a concept widely discussed in contemporary cure theory. Upon reverting to her human form, Preziusta reveals a resilient and virtuous character that captivates the prince. Her transformation challenges patriarchal norms of beauty and underlies the importance of recognizing women's worth beyond physical attractiveness. This aligns with Naomi Wolf's beauty myth concept, where societal beauty standards are critiqued as tools used to undermine uh, women's empowerment. The Sheba provides a powerful narrative that weaves together a critic of, of patriarchal gender norms and a celebration of the intersectionality of identities. The tale engages with a feminist discourse and intersectional theory, revealing the constraints of societal norms and advocating for the appreciation of individual autonomy, resilience, and multidimensional identities. In doing so, it implores readers to look beyond simplistic categorizations, embracing the complexity and diversity of individual experiences. The prince's non-traditional affection towards Preziusa, even when she assumes the form of a she-bear, challenges the heterosexual matrix just that Judith Butler argues limits our understanding of gender and sexuality. His ability to recognize and appreciate Preciosa's kindness, service, and eventually her physical beauty disrupts conventional norms and redefines the standards of attraction. Her ultimate acceptance and celebration in the court of the king is an assertion, assertion of her diverse identities, a testament of the, to the possibilities that open up when the intersections of identity are acknowledged and respected. The Sheba also brings to light the complex intersections between class, gender, and species. Preziusa's ability to move between different classes, space, classes spaces, from the forest to the royal court and to the command, 
respect and authority in uh, both spaces reveals the flexibility of identity and the potential for individual to challenge their prescribed social role, roles. Her interaction with different species as a human with animals in the forest and as a she bear with humans in the court furthers the exploration of identity beyond the human centric lens, a concept often discussed in contemporary post humanist theories. Basile's narrative does not simply stop at revealing the underbelly of patriarchal norms, but also paves the way for imagining a world that acknowledges and respects diverse intersecting identities. By challenging the prescribed standards of beauty and subverting traditional gender roles, this tale uh, illuminates the path towards a society where identity is not confined to binary notions, but is understood as fluid, complex, and intersecting. The other story, the three citrons, uh, offers a fertile ground for applying a post-colonial feminist lens, providing insights into the socio-political constructs of gender, race, and power that underpin its narrative. Primarily, the story's main protagonist, the prince, stands as an emblem of patriarchal and colonial hegemony. His relentless quest for a bride, who fits a narrowly defined ideal of beauty, as white as cheese and as red as blood, is indicative of what Naomi Wolf describes as the beauty myth. This obsessive fixation is an overt example of the patriarchal gaze, much in line with Malvi's male gaze theory, I referred to before, and reinforces a Eurocentric standard of beauty, thereby marginalizing women who do not conform to this aesthetic criterion. The prince's aspiration, characterized by color and class-based biases, echoes the Eurocentric biases that define the civilized and the savage, as proposed by Said in his seminal work, Orientalism. This Eurocentric gaze not only contributes to an aesthetic hierarchy, but also perpetuates a socioeconomic one manifested in the subjugation of women, especially those of color. The tale uses the Oriental trope of presenting the other as magical, exotic, and in need of saving. The portrayal of the black and enslaved woman in Basile's tale mirrors this dual subjugation. Operating under the yoke of race and gender, she embodies the experience of intersectionality. The black woman, ultimately vilified and punished for her ambition and transgression, is subjected to a narrative that fortifies racial and gendered stereotypes, resonating with Spivak's concept of the silenced subaltern. Interestingly, the fairy emerging from the citron presents an exotic spectacle, fulfilling the prince's aesthetic fantasy. Her emergence from the foreign and enigmatic citron fruit and her possession by the prince reflects a form of cultural imperialism, harking back to the notion of the exotic other, a trope prevalent in Western colonial literature. The narrative's treatment of the fairy as a coveted object to be possessed and ultimately domesticated, underscores Butler's concept of performativity. This is exemplified by the fairy's transformation into a bird, signifying her limited agency within the prince's heterosexual matrix. I think I still have 10 minutes, is that correct, if I'm not mistaken? Can I? Yeah, it's fine, actually. We're, we're fine. OK, I will try to finish in six minutes. <laughs> Despite the evident patriarchal and colonial undertones, the three citrons can be perceived as subtly subversive when scrutinized through a post-colonial feminist lens. The fairy's transformative emergence from the citron fruit symbolizes the theme of rebirth and resistance common in post-colonial literature, suggesting an underlying resilience in the face of oppressive forces. Moreover, the denouement of the tale, where the prince gains a more profound understanding of the unfolding events and punishes the deceitful slave, could hint at the potential critic of the prevailing patriarchal norms. However, it is noteworthy that despite his perceived transformation, the prince's 
newly found empathy doesn't significantly disrupt the status quo, nor does it provide a truly liberating space for women. The tale perpetuates Eurocentric beauty standards again, reinforces, uh, it reinforces gendered hierarchies and uses racialized characters to augment these narratives. Nonetheless, it also offers subtle instances of subversion and avenues for resistance. Although these moments are not transformative in radically redrawing the established power relations, they hint at potential disruptions to the patriarchal and colonial hegemony. The role of the black and estate woman, for instance, while ultimately tragic, nevertheless showcases a form of resistance against her subjugated position. By appropriating the princess's love interest and assuming her role, she employs subversion as a means of survival. This act of resistance, while it does not end in her favor, is a testament to her agency within her confined circum circumstances. Equally compelling is the fairy's own resistance to the princess' attempted control over her. Her transformation into a bird can be read as a rejection of the princess's possessiveness, thus asserting her own autonomy. The act of shape-shifting, a motive often associated with fluid identities, emphasizes the fairy's ability to transgress the rigid boundaries of the princess's heterosexual matrix. Another form of subversion is reflected in the prince's own journey, although the tale remains ensnared. In, uh, in the patriarchal colonial discourse, the prince's learning journey and subsequent transformation imply a critic of these oppressive systems. His initial fixation on a specific aesthetic criteria gradually evolves into a more nuanced understanding of love, companionship, defying the narrow confines of the beauty myth. While these instances of resistance and transformation are neither comprehensive nor entirely liberating, they are underlined the importance of unpacking such narratives through a post-colonial feminist lens. It is through this lens that we can critically examine the sociopolitical constructs within these tales and discern the subtle moments of resistance and subversion that emerge within them. This lens thus not only allows us to critique the oppressive structures embedded within such tales, but also to can envision the potential for alternate narratives that challenge and resist these structures. As a short, now I make a short reference to the Enchanted Doe. In the Enchanted Doe, the actions of the uh, jealous queen and the journey of the twin brothers reflect gender dynamics and power relations within a patriarchal society. The queen's resentment towards Oneloro and her subsequent actions demonstrate the harm caused by the patriarchal norms and expectations. The brothers' journey and their eventual reconciliation hint at the power of brotherhood in challenging patriarchal norms. Their shared journey signifies a collective resistance to patriarchal structures with their unity, symbolizing the power of solidarity in achieving freedom. Similar to the Shebear, the kingdom's name Clearwater indicates a place of truth and uh, realization, paralleling the brothers' journey towards self-realization and liberation from societal norms. Uh, Lorenzo referred to the name of the first kingdom in the Shebear, the dry rock. It's quite symbolic, dry rock in comparison with running water. So uh, in the first kingdom of the father, we have rigidness uh, of thought, of actions, whatever. And then when, we, when she comes to the new kingdom, we have running water. Here also in uh, the enchanted doe, we have clear water. So the name symbolism is very, very important here. So, uh, in the end, Giambattista's fairy tales are not only whimsical narratives filled with magical transformations and fantastical adventures. Um, they offer a complex exploration of gender, race, and power dynamics reflective of the socio-cultural context from which they emerged. From a modern perspective, these tales allow us to explore key issues of gender and race stereotypes, the animalization of dehuman, the animalization or dehumanization of women, the dichotomy of culture and nature, the intersectional forces and intersectional forces of feminism and uh, racialism.
So the animalization or dehumanization of women, as uh, seen in the she bear, is a profound metaphorical tool employed by Basile. It represents women's alienation and marginalization in a patriarchal society and can be viewed as an act of rebellion and resistance. In the gar uh, gender dichotomy of culture, that is man and nature woman, Basile's tales represent women as connected to nature as seen in the transformation of Preciusa. Nature becomes the refuge and source of empowerment for these characters, symbolizing an inherent resistance to patriarchal culture. So um, what is very important is to note that this story problematizes race relations, juxtaposing the privilege of the white heroine with the tragic fate of the black slave, underlining the inequities of race and gender. In conclusion, Basile's fairy tales provide a platform for critiquing social norm, societal norms and power structures from gender, race, and postcolonial perspectives. They serve as reminders of the continued relevance of these issues, inspiring conversations about gender roles, racial equality, and women's empowerment in our contemporary world. Thank you. Thanks, David and Nemanja. Um, if anybody has any questions for Nemanja and David, we've got time to go through them. If you want to put your hand up, that helps me figure out. There's um, lots of happy people in the chat saying that this was amazing and brilliant. <laughs> and Lorenza has her hand up. Thank you. Uh, let me just, uh, okay, raise the legacy hand. Thank you very much for these two splendid papers from which I've learned a lot. <laughs> I have a, a question for, or possibly a comment for uh, Nemanja. Nemanja, you rightly highlight the connections between Naples and the Mediterranean world and uh, uh, the Dalmatian world. And this is absolutely correct. So you trace um, instances of oral disseminations of some uh, tropes that we see in uh, variants of uh, uh, tales produced in different geographical areas in the Mediterranean. Um, I just would like to highlight um, um, an, an aspect of uh, um, early 17th century, um, the early 17th century in the Neapolitan milieu that may uh, help perhaps to find new ways of looking at this material. So when Basile was in Naples and he became members of various academies, he also joined an academy called the Incauti Academy. Uh, the Incauti Academy had within its community a large Dalmatian group, a group of Dalmatian scholars, mainly coming from Dubrovnik, Ragusa, uh, who were in contact with Naples and established themselves in the city to the extent that one of them, but although this happened after Basile's life in the 1640s, uh, Vincenzo Comneno, became the president of this academy, which, um, which um, um, promoted the use of vernacular and popular culture. And in fact, some academic speeches were delivered in, it, in uh, Neapolitan and constitute a sort of uh, meeting point uh, between different cultures that merge were merged within this um, this circle and this is the only circle to which Giulio Cesare Cortese also <laughs> belonged so I was wondering whether this community was sparked a sort of debate on Mediterranean culture and tales, tales of magic that may have influenced Basile in some of the tales that you have discussed. Thank you very much for this interesting information. Uh, it really it really provides a kind of new insight. Um, uh, um, Renaissance and Baroque literature is not my um, precise field of work, so I will have to check some details with colleagues who are in the field, but uh, the, the, the information is really 
available on many levels. Um, actually, uh, it perhaps uh, opens the, if you're speaking in that way of influences and so on, uh, per, per, perhaps the tail cross the, the, the Adriatic the other way around. But, but of course, uh, uh, even that is not the, the, uh, the most important thing. The most important thing is per, perhaps the very milieu where people could exchange between different yes. levels of, of, of culture. So thank you for, for this. Thank you. I can send you some articles that um, address this topic and more specifically the presence of a, a Dalmatian community mm -hmm. in Naples and within Neapolitan academies. Um, and some of these people were very much part of the network, the Neapolitan network of Basile uh, himself. I will be very much indebted for that. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your paper. Thank you. It's really good. All right. It seems like we might have come to the end of far more questions. So um, we might be able to. Um, Sue, sorry, do you want do you want us to maybe move you back 15 minutes? Uh, so we still get a 15 minute tea break now. Sorry, you're on me. Put you in you. Yes, uh, have, have the tea break by all means. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we could come back. Uh, what do you think? Sorry, Lawrence, I'm going to look at you. We can either have a half hour tea break or just do a 15 minute tea break and I'll resend a new schedule for the next bit. Um, I, I leave it to you to decide, to our audience. <laughs> Anything that suits you better. <laughs> All right, let's do a 15 minute tea break and come back for the keynote at 11.45. 11 um, but yeah, if you, if you don't want to, if obviously put your mics on and have a chat and have a little bit of a networking time as well if you don't want to have a screen break. It's entirely up to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stop recording.